Hi, this is Pastor Dave, continuing with our series for Advent based upon the book Making Room, Sharing the Love of Christmas by Ed Robb, R-O-B-B. And today uh, we're going to consider the session that he, re he titles Welcoming Welcome Strangers. He begins with this prayer. God of the stranger, we recall how Mary and Joseph traveled far from their home to a temporary stay in Bethlehem and how difficult that was. Keep us ever mindful of those who come into our lives for either a brief time or to stay, that we may extend the heart of Christ to them. Amen. And we have two readings that I want to share with you today. One goes way back into the history of Israel, uh, back to the time of the Babylonian exile. Now this is hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And the Babylonian Empire had succeeded in destroying the uh, Judean forces, capturing Jerusalem and controlling that whole area. And the Babylonian way of dealing with uh, nations they had conquered is, is to not just be satisfied military defeat, but to relocate principal members of that society to other places in the empire, and then bringing people from other places in the, the Babylonian empire and settling them in this newly conquered area so that they could fully conquer the culture, the way of life, and extend the uh, Babylonian empire uh, in more than just in the form of control over with taxation and military, but to literally make it part of Babylon. That was the way they dealt with people, and, and it was very cruel and, uh, and very hard on people. So Jeremiah is a prophet that lives around this time, and he is experiencing this exile himself, but he's not in Babylon, but he writes to them. And he indicates what God's word is to them in the midst of this, of this terrible experience they're having of being forced from their homes under the threat of death and being forced to resettle in a place unfamiliar to them. This is from Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Hence the reading. So the advice, well, I shouldn't say the advice, the commandment of God as Jeremiah is communicating to them is settle in. Make this place your home where I have put you. You know, plant food, build homes, uh, marry, have children. And it, it, it's clear that they're going to be there for generations and that they're to make it their home and to participate in the in the the uh, the place you live because it's to your benefit because as they as they uh, succeed so shall you so this is a protracted period of time perhaps certainly for the rest of the lives of the original exiles and even into generations make it your home the second reading that we have um, is from the book of Matthew now this takes place in Jesus' life when he is still very small, likely a toddler from what we learn about um, from this account, that he was somewhere between birth and two years old, but likely a, a little bit older, maybe two, and but still very young. And what has happened is, is that his birth has taken place. We have the account in Matthew. And in Matthew, we're told about the visit of the Magi, the wise men. And we often think of them as being three because of the number of gifts. However, there's no, no number 
we don't know how many. There surely were more than three people there because they would not have traveled with such valuables alone. And they would have had retainers with them and servants, that kind of thing. And they would have had uh, undoubtedly soldiers to protect them. So we, we know from the story that when they entered into Judea, they went to see the ruler of that day, who was King Herod. And uh, King Herod would receive them and hear their explanation why they were there, that they were searching this, this special uh, individual to be born, whose birth was heralded by the, a sign in the sky of a new star. And Herod, being very interested in a king being born in his lands, especially one who would be called King of Kings and Lord of Lords, wants to know uh, when they find this child, supposedly so that he could go and also pay his respects, uh, his ho make homage to this child, which of course we know from the story that wasn't his intent. But the, the Magi, the wise men didn't know that. So they agreed and they have found the child uh, they have presented their gifts. They have seen this, uh, the result of what they understood to be the prophecy of the star, but also the prophecy that they heard was unique to the, the people of Israel being fulfilled. And they've been warned that, uh, that the intent was that uh, Herod would, had intended bad, it, it, the intention of Herod was to do terrible things to that child and that family. So they leave by a different way. They don't go back. So time passes, apparently up to two years. But anyway, it's after they left that the story picks up on uh, what happens to Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And we read now from chapter 2, verse 13, and read through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentations, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in the dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when hearing that Archelaus was ruler over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Here is the reading of the gospel. So we're asked to consider today, uh, in light of these two readings about people being forced from their homes and becoming strangers in a new place, what it might feel like. And the way that we're asked to enter into thinking about this is to think back on a time perhaps when we moved to live in a new place. Now, if that's been your experience, you can identify uh, with what it's like to move to a new place. Um, if you haven't, uh, let me try to help you a little bit from my own experience, myself and my family. We've moved quite a bit over the course of my being a pastor. Uh, initially, we moved from Madison uh, up into the northwestern part of the state, into a small town. Uh, and they had different customs, different ways of, of, of uh, doing things. Not radically different. We didn't feel like we had went to another nation or anything like that. But ironically, uh, the first year I was there, the uh, United Methodist women were studying about refugees, of which we've just read about 
two groups of refugees. Um, and uh, they were asked to find, to find someone who was like a refugee who had come into a place from somewhere very different and to describe, describe what that was like for them. And they didn't have anybody, so they asked me. <laughs> so I was the program. What was it like to come from a city like Madison and travel up into the northwest area, uh, which was north of Eau Claire, and what it was like to to be there, and, and you know, and, and it was fun, and, and we could talk about it, and it was different. It was quite an experience to go from what had been our life uh, for some time in the Madison area, and now to make a new life and a new work uh, in a place. Um, well, especially different from my own experience. I didn't grow up on a farm like my, as my wife did, but we were surrounded by farms. But they had different practices, different traditions, and it was actually very interesting, very exciting in a way. What's it like to go into a new place? Well, it's kind of exciting and new, uh, you know, and you have things to discover. So what is the first thing that you do oftentimes when you're in a new place like that, where you know you're going to be staying for a, a longer period of time, not just for a short time, like in vacation? Well, first you, you get accustomed to your home. Make sure it's stocked with things that you need, like food and provisions and such. And you then begin to branch out a little bit. Now, our custom was always sort of walk the neighborhood to get to know where we lived. If we lived out in the country, we walked some of the country roads or went into the town nearby and walked around. Then we would drive and go a little extend that distance and become familiar with our area. Get to know where the stores were, movie theaters, the library, get our card, that kind of thing. Um, become familiar with our new place and kind of settle in. Uh, because the goal of the stranger in such a circumstance is, is to become a stranger no more, to become familiar and to be and for the people to become familiar to you and you to become familiar to the people that live there. So it's more akin to what Jeremiah said to those who were in exile in Babylon. Make a home, you know, uh, make your home where you are. Go on with your life. Um, so, at least in our experience, that's what that was like. It's just kind of strange and exciting all at the same time. And but eventually you become fairly comfortable. You become fairly, uh, you come to know your area and you start to make some friends. And, of course, being a pastor, you immediately have a congregation of people that want to know you, and you get to know neighbors a little quicker that way, at least those associated with your church. Others take a little longer, which leads us into the second thing we're asked to consider. How were you received? Well, you've had to have that experience, uh, and you're received in different ways. Now, we have the fortunate aspect of having a position that people wanted to receive you, wanted to, to get to know you, and wanted you to be... Uh, welcomed, feel welcomed, and we've always felt welcomed by the churches where we've been sent. But for others, um, think about how how people tend to be with strangers. A little standoffish, a little formal, not sure who you are, and you're not sure who they are. And you know, there's this kind of getting to know each other, uh, hospitality kicks in, curiosity. Now, if you look like and talk like and have similar uh, a similar similar cultural background, that's a little easier, unless you don't. In which case, that whole situation is uh, made much more um, complicated. Again, the what is the advice that Jeremiah? Well, actually, the commandment he extends from God. Make it your home, you know, work to not be the stranger anymore. And with that comes the expectation of hospitality on behalf of those to, whom's home, to whose region or home area you have come. It's, the whole goal here is for you and, and they who are there to limit that time you are a stranger and uh, to 
work towards you being a stranger no more. So how were you received? I guess you've had that experience. Again, we've had the, that same experience and um, and they don't know who you are and you don't know who they are and so you're a little cautious, but also curious. Now, the, the, uh, the thing we're asked now to go uh, to consider is well, what if you were forced? Now, while I was required by my uh, work to go where I've gone, or my education required me. Um, it, I couldn't call. I couldn't say I was forced. I always had a choice. We always could say no. But what if you didn't, couldn't say no? How does that complicate these matters even further? How uh, how are you supposed to make it your home when you don't want to be there and you're forced there? And how is that going to affect the relationship with those with whom you are now the stranger, um, and how they receive you? If they understand you're there not by choice but by by being forced there and you don't have any intention on staying the longer you have to and if you do have to stay uh, it's not going to be a pleasant experience and it's going to be a long and, and hard road it's a different thing altogether isn't it and these two passages of scripture that we read today were about a small group a single family being forced but only for a time and they were understood to be a temporary stay. So they didn't really have to worry so much about this aspect of being a stranger. They just needed to be careful until such a time as they could return. And this much earlier group uh, that were told that this is how it was going to be for the rest of their lives, and perhaps the lives of their children, perhaps even their children's children, maybe longer. So make the best of it. This is something that we in our nation today need to think about because uh, we are a nation, as they say, of immigrants. Uh, my, my family immigrated here uh, very um, late in the uh, 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, and this has been our home. I'm, I'm a second generation American. My father was born here, my grandfather was not. And I can't imagine anywhere other than this as being home. But we are a nation of immigrants, as they like to say, and some place, somewhere along the line, very likely the vast, vast majority of us came, our families came from somewhere else. Now, not forced necessarily. Uh, my family elected to come to America. But we certainly have a history of those who live in this country who did not choose the entire group that were affected by uh, slavery in the early uh, time prior to this nation being a nation and shortly into its time as a nation where slavery was a part of the experience in this country. Those people were forced from their homes and sold into slavery. And they essentially had to make their home here, and their descendants have made their home here too. But the history goes back to being forced. Others have been forced here because of war or you know, social unrest, uh, the threat of criminals in their own country, most often associated with some kind of drugs that is intolerable. They couldn't, they couldn't stay, and they had to leave and find a place of refuge. For some, it was considered, I'm sure, in their minds to be temporary. Or along the lines of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. We'll go there for a time until things cool off. What we want to do is return to our homes. For others, it was to make a permanent break with that home and to realize they were going to be spending the rest of their lives and probably the lives of their children, who knows how long, uh, in this new place. They go home. What's that like for them? So what we're asked to, to think about in this study during this season of Advent as we consider the, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ that unites us all as brothers and sisters. What's it mean to welcome a stranger? What does it mean to be a stranger? And how might we uh, do so living out the commandment of God that we are to love our neighbors, we love ourselves, regardless of who that neighbor is, where they come from. So let's think about that as we continue on in Advent.
about what it means to welcome the stranger uh, by trying to identify what it's like to be a stranger ourselves and what that's been like and, and how we felt and maybe understand each other a little better. Let's pray. Mighty God, we ask your blessing upon our time in Advent. We ask you continue to show us uh, the way to live in accordance with the love that uh, you have shown us and live that love in our lives towards others. For indeed, we are all connected. We are all brothers and sisters truly in this world that you have given us. So we pray for your blessing. We pray for your guidance. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. Thank you, and until next week, may God bless you.